recruit, develop talent in the network society. Bina Sharesia, please welcome up on stage. <laughs> Very welcome to the sign stage. So, so how, how, does, how does it feel to wake up in the morning and have so many people to care about in I don't know how many countries, <laughs> how many cultures and ages and so forth? Feels great, actually. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to work at a great company. Um, I have a little bit of experience behind me in doing this. So uh, for me, it's every day is a new day, a day in which you can make a difference. And um, what I worry about then is, am I forward thinking enough mm. to anticipate some of the things that I might not be doing or I might not be thinking of right now? But you, I was going to ask you, what, what are the things you're not thinking about right now? But I had to find a new question. I mean, you, you've been in Silicon Valley, you've been working there extensively, and you've also been working with very, very large organizations. What are some of the things that you think will change in HR? That, that is going to be completely different than the sort of the HR challenges. Or maybe, how has it changed? And sure. then we can look at how it will change. How has it changed since you started? <laughs> I'm going to age myself and date myself when I tell you this. But it's changed tremendously. So, you know, if you think about um, HR, you think about some basic elements, right? If you think about people, you think about hiring them, you think about developing them, you think about rewarding them, etc. So um, the pace of change is so fascinating, even since the time when I graduated from college. So let's just take one part of it. How do you hire people? Mm -hmm. right? um, when I graduated, it was all about looking at um, job boards, going through college recruiting, trying to understand which are the big companies out there that you want to join. Now it's so different. Yeah. Right? So just take an aspect of um, how do you get to talent? Social media, and you just saw the stats over here also, social media has totally taken over, mm. right? Uh, so it, now it's no longer about going to a college recruiting center. Now recruiters will say, in fact, this is a stat, 92% of recruiters um, have said that they have used or plan to use social media to recruit, and 73% have said that they have used social media to successfully hire a candidate. I mean, think about that. How mind-boggling is that, right? Yeah. And so, do you look at, looked at the sort of the, the, the network equity of somebody, or do you look at somebody's party pictures at Facebook, or sort of <laughs> how is it only LinkedIn, or do you try to see what they are as social individuals as well? Or how does that, how does that pan out? It actually works on both sides, right? So on the recruiting side, um, you know, you sort of have your archived life that you can look into. Recruiters say that they go in and they look at people's profiles, mm -hmm. whether it's on Facebook or anything else, they can look at profile to get a better idea about the person they're trying to hire. But on the flip side, it's not just about who you're trying to hire, it's also about people, whether they choose to come to work for you, right? Now it's becoming so much more important because now people are wondering whether they should work for you or not. Right? So now they want to see what you can do for them. Right? So when they, you started, it was like, please give me a job. And now it's like, what can you do for me? You know, I got out of college. I thought I was so lucky. I was so blessed. I went to work for PepsiCo. It was a great company. Now they want to understand. They'll go, you know, people, when they graduate from college, they'll go to sites like Glassdoor.com. And out there, they want to look at the reputation of a company. Are you an employer worthy of their choice? Right? They also want to know about not just what your product is, but more about what difference you make, mm. right? Mm. So your company's reputation is important, and they have access to that, right? With these devices and social media and being connected everywhere. They want to know, whatever you're doing to earn your money as a company, are you doing it in the right way, right? So are does you... values become more important? I or... think so. I think values and reputations become extremely important, because what you have going on is a level of transparency that we've never seen before. Right? People, technology is this great enabler. Right? It's a great equalizer. You have access to information, and you're constantly connected in your network. And so you're talking about which company should you join or should you not join. Right? What products are they doing? Are they socially responsible? Mm. Do they have sustainability? Mm. Things that people never thought about in the past become so important now. So technology is becoming a much more important part of HR. So is it going sort of from, from a uh, touchy-feely art to a science? Or how's that going to evolve? Uh, yeah, you know, as the world evolves and the change takes place and accelerated change that we have today, uh, ways of working have to change, and same in my profession of human resources, right? Mm -hmm. So I talked to you a little bit about recruiting. Now if you think about development, 
mm. right? When you think about development and how do you build the skills and the competencies that you need, that's changed, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Before, it was about going to a classroom and taking a training class. And then we came up with this concept of 70, 20, and 10, which really says development takes place 70% through experience, 20% through learning from others, and 10% through formal learning. Well, that paradigm is now being called into question, right? Because with technology, you can access anything you want anytime, mm -hmm. so the classroom becomes history. The training room becomes history, right? So now it's about the, 20, the 70 and the 20 sort of seep together. So you can't rely on the same parameters. So how you develop people also has to change. You have to have different ways of getting people to learn from each other, leverage their network, especially when you think about the digital natives or the millennials. We had a, a little uh, HR pre-sign breakfast today where we gathered a lot of the interesting HR directors from the region. And, and there was, somebody said, I started with HR because I care about people, and now I have to deal with technology. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. Do you think technology is an enabler? Is this sort of the, the network society, is that better for HR, or is it some, something that, that is sort of challenging for HR? No, I think it's better. I think it's better for mm -hmm. HR. It just, um, it's just your way of working has to change. So technology is an enabler, will be as much of an enabler as you allow it to be. You can shy away from it, but you really have to deal with it, mm -hmm. right? And you can use it to allow you to connect with your employees in ways that you never did before. You can use it to find out about your employees. You can use it to motivate them and encourage them to work in ever better ways. But uh, there's, there's a, a, there must be a cultural sort of rift between somebody who's 60 years old, uh, they're sitting in Sweden, yeah. they've been with Ericsson for a very long time, they're very good at what Ericsson has been doing for a long time, and then you recruit somebody in Bangalore who's 18, and then you recruit somebody who's uh, you know, in, in, in Silicon Valley who's 30. Sure. Different places in the world, completely different maybe generation of thinking. Yeah. How do you sort of bridge those gaps? And what, what, are, what are the, 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 the young people want now? What is important sure. for them that is different? Yeah. So, you know, you reference the, the, let me say, cultural divide with different countries, right? Mm -hmm. um, that there are ways of dealing with, because most global companies operate in so many countries mm -hmm. that, you know, you, it becomes sort of seamless. Uh, the more challenging one is the generational difference, right? When you have a multi-generational workforce that you're working with, and you have technological shifts, mm. right? So how do you bridge the gap? So, and I'll speak more generally also, not just about my company, but mm. if you just speak more generally, and if you think about what you have to deal with, um, you have a generation that works very differently. They question all parameters. They learn from each other, right? They are wiki smart. Um, they work hard and they work slow. They want to work on tasks that they find exciting. They rather ignore or not deal with the routine and mundane tasks. And then you have this other generation that's more used to rigor and hierarchy and structure and best practices. How do you bridge that? Especially if you have managers that belong to one side. Yeah, so the managers are the old guys. And yeah, uh, yeah. Your words, not mine. But, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then you have the rest, right? So how do you bridge? So as I think about it, you've got to bridge certain gaps, right? One is the communication gap, mm -hmm. right? It's no longer face-to-face, -face, sit across the table, talk. So how do you get, you know, managers and leaders to use technology to understand the new ways of working, right? That's one. Next is um, what I think is the values gap, you know? You tend to value routine, you value structure. Well, the other side values creativity, ambiguity, shifting work, smart work, right? So how do you bridge that gap? And then I think, um, you know, this is funny, and then there's that whole infrastructure gap, because the people that you try to hire at home, they have the best tablets, they have the smartphones, they have devices all over, and then when you go to work, you're presented with this big laptop that's bigger than your head, right? Three <laughs> times the size of your head. How do you do that? How do you motivate somebody to say, wait, am I supposed to work like this? Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to put in certain hours when I'd rather work in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. right? So I think you can use technology to get past all of that and work smart and work in different ways. But how do you, how do you manage then if you're not, if you, you're, how can you be in charge when you're not in control? <laughs> ah, that's a good one. Um, it's a different way of thinking about it, right? When you think about, um, you have to have as a company, mm. Um, you have deliverables, you have results, so you, you need to have uh, work deliverables, so you need to have direction, right? 
But how do you have direction without becoming restraining? Or was a, was, as we talked about it, how do you have command over a situation without necessarily being in a controlling mode, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's a way of shifting where, you know, you have to, managers have to work a little bit differently and say, it's okay. I do not have to be in charge of everything. It's okay, I can let my team work it. Mm -hmm. It's a new way of thinking, and it's hard for some. But that's the way of the future. And, and how do you sort of look upon uh, HR developing in the future? How do you see that, that sort of what would be the major shifts? If we sit here 10 years from now, how's, how's talent uh, development or, or, or HR as a whole, what are some of the major shifts? Yeah. Um, it's crazy, isn't it, when you think <laughs> about change and you think about, you know, when I grew up, you always had this axiom that the past is a reliable indication of the future, right? You think that the sun always rose in the east, so when I wake up tomorrow, the sun's going to rise in the east. Now you start to question that, right? Um, with this rapid pace of change, the work that you do in human resources, the work that, even if you're not in human resources, you know, if you're working and you, and you, and you have to, how do you hire people differently? How do you develop people differently? So I think we'll start seeing shifts um, where what worked for us in the past won't work. So that means, you know, classroom is history, workspace is history, right? Your workspace, your, your, the, the, the divide between your work life and your private life becomes blurry. So in the past, you know, you put in your 40 hours days, then you went home and you, you managed your life and everything else, right? Then it started getting a little bit blurry when you sort of took work home, you could take your laptop home. Mm. For the next 10 years, you got to think about what will that be? Where, where is the divide? Mm. Is there such a thing as a divide? Is there lifestyle work? And how do you deal with that? Mm. How do you still manage to get deliverables and results when all the ways in which you've been used to working are different. And maybe also when career goals are different. How, how do you see that? What is sort of the, in Silicon Valley, if you're 25, what is yeah. career for you? Yeah. You know, career goals used to be linear. You do well, you get promoted up, you do well. Now that's called into question because it's less important for people, and I think it'll be even more so to your earlier question, Ola. It's less important for people to think about um, linear growth, right? Now it's more about spider webs. So it's not unusual in Silicon Valley, and I would warrant in other countries as well, that people really want to work for certain people. And because everything is transparent, they know. Everyone knows everyone, mm. right? You may not physically know somebody, but you know of people. Their reputations precede them, right? So the network supersedes the organization, right? So a career would mean working with somebody. So it's not unusual to see a senior engineer leave a company, and before you know it, the whole team's followed them to go into this other company. You know, you can hire a network, mm, right? Mm. Um, and in those ways of thinking, then you've got to think about, hmm, how, how, do you, how do you cope with that? So what, what are some of the sort of the, 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 the worst and the best things with HR? Well, the best certainly is um, you get to work with people. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in the axiomatic way, but you get to hire people, you get to develop them, you get to make their dreams come true, you yeah. get to you know, reward them, pay them. So that's the great side of it. Um, the downside or the worst side of it is when unfortunately, sometimes you have to let people go. Mm -hmm. And that's never easy, no matter when mm -hmm. it happens or how often it happens, mm -hmm. that's the hardest part when you have to let good people go. And, and um if you would write a book, which I hope you will someday, about sort of HR, the true story, or if you would coach somebody who manages a, a, an HR company, what are some of the things that you would sort of, what are some of the, the first things you want to see in place? Or how would you like to sort of uh, to make sure they're doing the right things? Yeah. You know, for me, I'm, I'm a pragmatist also, right? So it's important to do the basics right, mm. right? You work for a company, you got to deliver results. So you got to make sure that the basics are right. So um, your people strategy, your plan, whatever it is, do that well. You know, how do you deliver on the business strategy? You've got to get that down pat. But don't stop there, especially today, especially when we're on the brink of a network society, because mm. stopping there will mean you're behind, right? Mm -hmm. So while you're making sure that the basics are done right, while you're delivering on the capabilities that your organization or your company needs today, start thinking about where you need to be. Right. Do you do that in an experimental way so that some guys can work from home at certain points of time and, or you play around with 
different things? Or how do you how do you maintain the core and, and still sort of change everything? You know, I think there was a speaker over here a little while ago that was talking about. Um, you can experiment in different things, but for me, it's like building the ship of Theseus upon the open seas, right? You're building the ship while you're trying to sail it, <laughs> right? Um, you have a direction, you, the destination, but you also have this journey to you don't know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is um, start seeing some of the trends of the people that you're bringing in, and you can start measuring you know, motivation and how they're doing things differently, and it's perfectly okay to try different things. You know, uh, somebody mentioned this concept of failure forward. It's okay. Try different things. You know, your training sessions. You know, you've been doing it a certain way. Try virtual classrooms and see how that works. Right? So the best the best test for me is uh, question your assumptions. Well, first make sure you're doing your basics well. Number two, question your assumptions and start seeing how you can prepare for that world of tomorrow and start being an evangelist for the change. At least I, I, I think that um, I would need to be an evangelist with my organization of, I th think that the destination is going to be there. So let's now, as if, you know, to use a sailing analogy, tack your sails to see how you might adjust to get over there. This, this society we're, we're sort of being very positive about, network society, a lot of people are going to join the party. Do you think there is a risk that other, some, some people are left outside, or do you think there will be a digital divide in terms of who's, who's in it and can choose their employer and who won't have a job, 54% of the young people in Greece? Or do you think that somehow we will f manage to harvest those talents and, and, and develop those regions as well because we can work remotely or in different ways? I think so. I, you know, like I said, I think that um, technology allows, is the great enabler, and it's also the great equalizer. So you do not, and the ways of working, will, technology allows it to be different. So you do not physically have to be somewhere to work for a company. So, you know, all, although we always think that, um, God, there's so many people that are coming out of universities, you know, how are we going to accommodate them all? Uh, at the same time, the war for talent is on, mm. right? The war for talent is on and constantly is for good talent, mm. right? So now you start thinking, where do the two meld, right? In the war for talent, so to your direct question, yes, they get accommodated but in different ways. It's not about going to work for one company. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can, you can do what you're doing and supply 10 different companies. Mm -hmm. So all of those will change. So thank you very much for coming here and sharing, and uh, I hope to, to read the book in the future sometime. <laughs> thank you very breath. much. Thank you.